Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to our program today. We are privileged to have with us Alexandra uh, De Sanctis Mar. Uh, she serves as a writer for National Review, and she writes on a number of topics, but she writes especially on the topic of abortion policy, uh, pro-life, the pro-life movement, issues tied to politics, culture, and religion. She also has a podcast that's entitled For Life. She is also a visiting fellow uh, for the Ethics and Public Policy Center, which is an institution that seeks to apply the riches of the Judeo-Christian tradition to contemporary questions of law, culture, uh, and also politics. And she's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame. Her major was political science. And we are thrilled to host you here uh, with the Biblical Worldview Institute of the Whitfield Center for Christian uh, Leadership. So welcome, uh, Alexander. We're glad to have you here. Thank you. Great to be with you. And thanks for the invitation. Yeah. And you're going to give a great presentation in just a second. But before you do that, I wanted to ask you, could you talk uh, just briefly about uh, your calling. How did you become a writer or a journalist? Could you talk about your calling and then maybe just tell us the path that you took to get to where you are right now? Sure. So I, I was raised uh, Catholic and so I've always had um, a sense of vocation and that I should you know, use my talents for the greater glory of God. I've always loved writing since I was very young. I, I started writing stories when I was uh, a kid and uh, when I was in high school and college in particular, I became especially interested in the abortion issue, the pro-life movement, and uh, journalism. And so um, I decided to pursue journalism as a career when I was in college, uh, and political journalism in particular. I've always liked National Review, and so when I was a, a senior in college, I applied to a postgraduate fellowship program they have. I was uh, lucky enough to receive an offer to work for them, and once I got there, uh, I found myself just always pursuing stories about the abortion issue and um, everyone I worked with was very open to me doing that and so the more I worked to the uh, the more important the issue became to me and the more uh, I was able to write about it and so I I think I you know, kind of one blessing after another led me to where I am. Very good well we're excited about your presentation and um, I'm just going to turn it over to you and you can take it away. Great well thanks again for the invitation to be here um, thanks to all of you for taking the time out of your afternoon to, to tune in today. Um, as I kind of alluded to, this topic has been important to me for a long time. Uh, and so what I want to address today is the pro-life movement broadly, but in particular, kind of give you a sense of the present state of the national debate we're having over abortion. And I'm sure uh, those of you who are, who are tuning in most likely follow the news closely on this issue or have a general sense of what's going on. And uh, it's kind of a good time to be giving this, top, uh, this talk because abortion has been a topic of a lot of debate and conversation in recent months and weeks. Um, there's this big Supreme Court case coming up this term, which could very well lead to the court overturning Roe, um, sending abortion policy back to the states finally after quite a long time. And recently, of course, Texas had its heartbeat law um, put in place. It hasn't yet been struck down. And so they're able to protect the unborn from a very early stage in pregnancy, which has led to a lot of controversy and debate as you might expect. So what I want to do in this talk, my aim is to help you understand kind of where we find ourselves in the pro-life movement at this moment, which I think is a pivotal moment. Um, and I'd like to try and give you the tools to think and talk about this debate in a clear, careful, and hopefully a morally upright way. Um, so I thought I'd start my talk today with a little story. Uh, a few years ago, I gave one of my first ever talks for a college audience uh, at the University of Scranton. I was talking about kind of similar to this, the pro-life movement. And my dad actually drove up from Virginia to be at my talk. And after, I remember he was offering me all sorts of ideas for how to improve as dads are wont to do. And um, he told me this story about myself that I don't think I had ever heard before. He said, when I was very young and just learning to talk, I was wandering around our house one morning um, and I came across a copy of this old famous issue of Life magazine. It was the one that had that picture of a fetus in utero on the cover. It was just lying on the floor, I guess. And uh, my dad told me that I stopped and I looked down at this magazine and totally unprompted, I pointed to this picture and I said, baby. I was essentially a baby myself, recognizing a baby, right? I, I knew as we all do that this is a human life. I had never seen that picture before. Uh, my parents didn't teach me to look at this and, and say that it was a baby. Uh, but when I looked down at it, I knew at two years old what I was looking at. 
I didn't know the first thing about debates over personhood or religion or uh, medicine or science, but I knew I was looking at a baby. Now, of course, this didn't look identical to a newborn coming home from the hospital. Um, I wasn't standing there contemplating the meaning of human life in the womb or, or personhood as a two-year-old. Um, but in essence, there's not any existential or intrinsic distinction at all between that baby inside her mother in that picture and that very same human being a moment after delivery. And that story my, my dad told me about myself makes a really compelling point. I think the heart of the pro-life movement, which is uh, whether we call this thing a, a clump of cells or a human being or an unborn child, this living thing is always a human being. And just like you and me, because of our shared humanity, this human being has the intrinsic right to life and deserves to have that right protected. If she doesn't have that intrinsic right to life, by virtue of her very humanity than none of us do. All of our, our rights are at risk if we deny her that right. Um, now, of course, like I said, that unborn baby is much, much smaller than we are, uh, is nowhere near as developed as we are, but each of us started that way too. Uh, we began our lives as an embryo, as a fetus, and we know, all of us, that these tiny living human beings are as human and as valuable as you and I are. Um, and I think even people who might say they support abortion uh, or that that choice, they might call themselves pro-choice, understand this, what I'm saying, on a fundamental level, right? If a, a family member tells us that she's pregnant and hangs up an ultrasound picture, that we don't say, oh, what a beautiful uh, product of conception you have there, right? We don't um, host parties for our pregnant sister's clump of cells. We ask when her baby is due or we host a baby shower. Um, all of us, when these human beings are wanted, we're comfortable acknowledging that they're human. Uh, we acknowledge that soon they'll be born, they'll continue to grow, just as they were doing in the womb, uh, first into toddlers, into children, teenagers, and then adults, just like every single one of us has done. Um, but somehow when these human beings are not wanted, we're taught to pretend that something else is here. Um, and of course, we, we all know, and perhaps some of us know on a personal level that Lots of women face very difficult, complicated situations, um, all types of suffering that can make abortion seem like an easy answer. But the truth is that abortion is harmful to women too. Uh, women deserve better than abortion. And they deserve better than being told that success, happiness depends on having the right to kill their own children. Um, because we all know, right? like I said, that abortion ends an innocent human life. And what's so interesting about this, I think, is that it's very rare to find an abortion rights supporter who's willing to admit that and who defends abortion on those grounds. And I, I can't really blame them, right? It's a difficult thing to acknowledge the humanity of the unborn and, and to defend that act of violence anyway. So instead, we're often told uh, by abortion supporters, for example, that, okay, maybe these unborn living things are human, but they don't have the right to life because they aren't legal persons, right? Um, they've redefined our terms our legal terms, essentially, to exclude the unborn from legal protection. Uh, the same way, by the way, that, that these legal redefinitions of personhood have been used always to justify discrimination, oppression, uh, to justify slavery, to justify discrimination against women, to justify extermination of groups that governments didn't want to protect. It's always been used in service of oppression. Um, and I like to start my talks with that, that story about myself as a kid, because I think it's a really helpful reminder of what exactly we're debating when we talk about abortion. Um, no matter what side of the issue we're on, we can't have an honest conversation about this very difficult topic unless we're all willing to acknowledge this reality that the unborn are human beings. So let me give you an example of, of what that means in practice. A couple of years ago, I went to Yale uh, to have a debate with a pro-abortion feminist and lawyer uh, named Jill Filipovich, who writes for The Guardian. Um, here's what happened. I got up on, on stage or in front of the group, um, and I gave an opening statement that was very similar to what I've been talking about here so far. Uh, you know, I said, the unborn person, this is a, a human being, and um, as a result of that fact, this human being has the same inherent right to life that we all do. And even though Jill Filipovich is a confident pro-choice activist, you know, writes and, and speaks about this all the time, never once in the entire debate did she acknowledge, let alone respond to my argument that these are human lives that are valuable? Now, how are we supposed to have an honest debate over abortion 
when one side of the argument is not even going to acknowledge this fundamental premise, right? Uh, I enjoyed the debate. I was happy to be there, but I was just amazed that we were supposed to have this conversation when she was unwilling to engage in that very fundamental aspect of what I was saying. Um, and I think that's that's a perfect example of why our debates over this issue tend to be so difficult. So in that context, now that I've given you kind of a, the lay of the land from my perspective, um, I want to give a brief overview of our political landscape right now when it comes to the abortion debate. And in particular, why are we fighting over this issue so intensely still and, and perhaps more intensely than we ever have a uh, half century after Roe v. Wade was decided? Um, like I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the, the court this term is going to hear a case about a law in Mississippi that bans abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy, uh, which could very well end up overturning Roe. Why are we having this case 50 years later? Um, abortion became the law of the land in 1973 when seven unelected, of course, Supreme Court justices decided that the constitution permits abortion. And th that decision took this issue, uh, probably the most highly controversial issue we've ever known, perhaps other than slavery, um, out of the turmoil and uncertainty of the political process, away from the ability of the people to vote for the laws they want. Um, and those of you who know your history know that this was not the first time the Supreme Court had tried to do something like this in order to stem the tide of unrest. In his infamous Dred Scott decision, Chief Justice Roger Taney essentially said he thought he could settle the question of slavery by taking it out of the democratic process. Uh, he thought maybe you know, the, the decision in Dred Scott would keep the union from descending into civil war. But we all know, of course, that's the opposite of what happened. And in my opinion, it's been the same with Roe. So to explain what I mean by that, um, let's just talk briefly about what's happening in states all across the country when it comes to abortion. Uh, despite the court's efforts to settle this debate, they thought it would go away if they decided Roe like this. Um, abortion obviously remains the most hotly contested political question in American life today. A couple of years ago, we saw uh, Democratic lawmakers enact a bill in New York that allowed abortion for any reason until 24 weeks of pregnancy, and it expanded a woman's ability to obtain abortion up until birth. Um, in Virginia, we had a Democratic lawmaker propose an abortion bill that she said would allow a woman to obtain an abortion even during labor. Uh, we saw the governor of Virginia say that unwanted newborn infants could be left to die from lack of care if they managed to survive an abortion procedure. We've seen Democrats in the Senate vote against a bill three years in a row now that does nothing other than requiring doctors to treat newborns who survive an abortion the same way they treat any other newborn baby. Uh, we've seen a number of states pass bills saying that abortion at any time and for any reason is a fundamental right. Now, obviously, this kind of extremism prompted huge pro-life backlash across the country. We saw states like Ohio, Missouri, Georgia, uh, quite a few others. Uh, pass bills protecting unborn children from the moment their heartbeats can be detected, similar to the bill recently passed in Texas. This was the most state-level activity the pro-life movement had seen in, in a, quite a long time. Uh, but what's notable about all of this is that even though this pro-life momentum was growing, even though abortion was becoming much more of a subject of focus in state legislatures across the country, almost every single pro-life law was immediately struck down in court and nothing happened to the pro-abortion laws. And that's because of Roe v. Wade, right? Roe prevents nearly any pro-life law from taking effect. And while pro-lifers have been prevented from protecting the unborn since Roe, the Democratic Party has been steadily marching in the other direction. So think back to the 1990s, Bill Clinton and, and other national Democrats would say, uh, abortion should be safe, legal, and rare, right? This was the, the Democratic Party catchphrase. Today, if you're a Democrat who uses this phrase, you're laughed out of the room, right? A couple, uh, I guess it was last year or whenever the, the Democratic presidential primary was, Tulsi Gabbard was running for president as a Democrat, used this phrase and was attacked by her fellow candidates uh, for you know, essentially attacking women's rights because she said abortion should be rare. That's not it, right? Uh, as recently as 10 years ago, there were Democrats in Congress who supported the Hyde Amendment, uh, which protects pro-life taxpayers from having to pay for abortions. Today, the Democratic Party formally opposes the Hyde Amendment and President Joe Biden, who for 40 years or something as a senator had supported Hyde, rejected it during his run for president because he wanted to be you know, accepted by the party as the nominee and that's what he thought he had to do. I don't think I could name, honestly, a single national Democratic politician who has 
said he supports, he or she supports a single restriction on abortion. Um, that's truly incredible. They favor allowing abortion at any point in pregnancy for any reason, fully funded by you and by me, the US taxpayers. Um, I mean, just a few weeks back, you had Democrats in the House nearly unanimously passing a bill that would prevent states from enacting a single pro-life law, including restrictions on abortion after the baby can survive outside the womb. Um, this is not a position, not only that the majority of Americans support, uh, but that Democratic voters don't even support. Uh, polls have found, for example, that as many as about a third of Democrats call themselves pro-life. Do we ever hear about these people? Um, only 18% of Democrats, according to one poll, favor allowing abortion in the last three months of pregnancy, which is the position officially held by the Democratic Party. Uh, so basically, the point I'm making is the Democratic Party has grown more and more radical on abortion while leaving most Americans behind, including a, a huge number of their own voters. But what's especially interesting about this, as they've done this, as they've become increasingly radical, left even their own voters behind, Democrats have kept winning elections, um, even as they vote for abortion laws, pass abortion law laws that are far out of step with their own voters. Uh, why is that? I think it's because we, as a culture, uh, refuse to talk about or don't want to talk about what abortion is. Uh, so this brings me back to, to the stories I started my talk with tonight, um, or today, I suppose. Think of me as a, a two-year-old looking down at that Life magazine cover, right? We all know this creature is a human being, uh, but when I showed up at Yale to debate a, a prominent pro-choice activist, she didn't even address my key argument. Um, this is how Democrats and, and people who favor unlimited abortion continue to win on this issue despite their extremism. I think they all too often get away with ignoring the heart of the pro-life position. Um, I think this is, this is the key to approaching this debate as a pro-lifer is to realize that this is what's happening. One of my favorite um, quotes that I think gets this point across uh, comes from a book that my colleague at National Review, Ramesh Panuru wrote a while ago. He wrote, abortion is the right that dare not speak its name. Um, and I think that's a really effective quote. And it, there's a reason that this is true, right? Abortion is the, the type of thing that thrives in the dark and in euphemisms. This is why you know, we're always hearing about uh, women's rights and women's health care and bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom and uh, the right to choose. But the right to choose what, right? We don't, we don't hear about the right to dispense with the life of an unborn human being. It doesn't look so pleasant out in the open when we talk about what abortion is. I don't think it, it feels like freedom to get an abortion. Uh, but these are the things that we hear about when we try to talk about abortion. I'll give you another example. Um, I don't know if any of you watch the Golden Globes. I don't watch the Golden Globes, but at last year's award ceremony, uh, this actress, Michelle Williams, pretty, pretty famous actress actually, gave an acceptance speech um, in which she used her shining moment on stage, getting this great award to talk about how she never could have achieved all the successes in her life if she hadn't exercised her right to choose. That's how she put it. Uh, what was she talking about? The right to choose what? To be an actress? To who knows? No, she was using her winning moment, standing in front of all these viewers across the nation, to tell us that she could not have succeeded in life without an abortion. But you know what's interesting? She didn't say the word abortion a single time. And if abortion is so great, she was so blessed to get rid of these unwanted human beings, why don't they say that? Right? And I think that silence speaks volumes. Um, here's another example. This is one of my favorites. Uh, a couple of years back, I remember seeing a, a CNN contributor in a segment on, on TV explaining that she opposes pro-life legislation because, quote, when a woman is pregnant, that is not a human being inside of her. It's part of her body. Um, this is the kind of anti-science thing we hear from people who are defending abortion. Uh, they would rather dismiss the unborn as not human or a parasite or a clump of cells. Uh, even though if any of us have looked at a 3D ultrasound of a fetus later in pregnancy, we all know that this is not true. Um, but this is because people who are arguing in favor of abortion rights don't want to get to that next step of the conversation. I think if they acknowledge that this is a living human, living human being, uh, they're in this ethical, philosophical minefield. They have to then explain why they think it's okay, in some cases at least, to end a human life. And that's much harder to do than make these claims about an unborn child not being human or not being alive 
or being part of the mother. So I'll close my talk here and, and take questions with just one final example. Um, I think this is what it looks like in practice and politics when abortion supporters have to admit what they're actually supporting. Think back to the 2016 presidential campaign, which feels like to me a million years ago, but I suppose wasn't, wasn't that long. Um, and as I observed most of the race, Democratic politicians really got away with not talking about abortion at all. Um, the first time Hillary Clinton was forced to talk about her stance on this was during the final uh, presidential debate when she gave this long response explaining why she supports Roe v. Wade and which she says the word abortion just one, one single time. Um, but that was not the only thing that happened in that debate. Uh, the moderator asked Hillary Clinton why she had voted against a ban on partial birth abortion back when she was in the Senate. And she gave you know, this response about how we need these procedures to protect the life and health, health of mothers, even though no one has ever demonstrated that this horrible procedure is necessary for women's health. Um, and when she finished giving this response, the moderator asked Donald Trump what he thought. And here's what he said. I'm going to quote it in full. And because Trump, unlike any politician I've ever seen speaking on this issue, cut straight to the heart of what's going on in the abortion debate. I think it's terrible, Trump said. If you go with what Hillary is saying, in the ninth month, you can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb of the mother just prior to the birth of the baby. Now you can say that that's okay, and Hillary can say that that's okay, but it's not okay with me, because based on what she's saying and based on where she's going and where she's been, you can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb in the ninth month on the final day, and that is not acceptable. What happened in that moment? Millions of people across the country heard straight from someone's mouth the reality of late-term abortion. And not only that, but suddenly Hillary Clinton was standing on that stage in front of those millions of viewers actually de defending abortion. She wasn't defending women's autonomy or reproductive freedom or the right to choose. She was defending the right to whip, rip a baby out of his mother's womb in the ninth month on the final day. Now, people can, can question Donald Trump in all numbers, uh, any number of ways, but that is the power of speaking the truth about abortion. Um, so as I conclude my remarks and, and take questions, I'll just leave you with that example. And my point has nothing to do with whether we should view Donald Trump as a pro-life hero or, or anything like that. But the fact remains that that year, pro-life voters turned out in huge numbers to support him. And I think it was because unlike most politicians on both sides of the aisle on this issue, uh, he was willing to talk about what abortion is. And I think that is what's so sorely lacking in this debate. For those of us who know that this is the taking of a human life, um, I think it's imperative to speak that truth. So that is what I would encourage you as people of faith, people who believe in the sanctity of human life to do. Uh, we have to speak that truth with love, of course, um, but without fear. And I think we have to look with clear eyes at the, the horrible reality of what this is um, let it touch our hearts and, and be willing to share that with others. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to give those who are on uh, a moment to uh, ask questions in just a little bit. If they like, they can type their questions in the chat box there. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, um, what are some trends in our culture when it comes to the abortion issue? What are some trends in our culture uh, that are a calls for, um, I guess, uh, you know, would would be positive, like some positive trends? And then what would be maybe some, some trends that might concern you when it comes to the pro-life movement that you see, just broadly speaking? Yeah, I think that one of the most hopeful trends, um, well, there's certainly a, an uptick, I would say, in pro-life sentiment. Um, if you look at public opinion polling, it seems pretty clear that, you know, regardless of how long this fight has gone on, the numbers of pro-life people have not only remained steady, but have increased over time. Um, which is definitely hopeful, but uh, perhaps more practically speaking, uh, we also know from the best data we have on, on pregnancy and, and abortion um, that over time, a higher number of unexpe uh, unexpected pregnancies have been carried to term uh, or, and are carried to term today than were a couple of decades ago, which I think is a huge testament to the pro-life movement, um, you know, not only explaining what abortion is, but also giving women the resources or, or helping women choose life even when they, they have an unexpected pregnancy. Um, so that would be one hopeful trend. In terms of disappointing trends, I think it's um, 
pretty much what, what I do for a living is disappointing because I have to look at a lot of people uh, arguing for abortion in, I think, a very intellectually dishonest way. And I don't know that that's a trend necessarily that might not be answering the question, but um, I think it's it's hard to see the pro-life movement making a lot of progress when so many of the loudest voices in our culture have the megaphone and are speaking so many falsehoods. Um, so that would be my pessimistic comment, I suppose. Mm -hmm. We um, Another question, we, we have a number of uh, students and faculty who will watch this uh, later and then who are watching now. Obviously, people don't have a lot of time like you do uh, to spend their, their time uh, focusing on abortion and, and keeping up with things. What are, what are one or two institutions or people uh, that you would recommend that um, students or faculty interested in this issue would focus on uh, because their time is limited, but who do you, who do you see really as uh, having understanding as far as where things are or where they're going when it comes to this issue? Yeah, I think there are a lot of really great um, pro-life institutions out there, and I, I guess I should mention that as a hopeful trend, but um, in particular, I know Students for Life uh, and Live Action both have a lot of traction with young people, and that gives me a lot of hope to follow their work. I think they have a, a great command of how to use video and social media and uh, you know make the pro-life movement very uh, argument very approachable and, and accessible to young people. Um, so I would recommend following them if you kind of want to get the, the soundbite way to make the argument for a, a younger audience. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right. Any questions uh, from those of you who are listening? Do you have a question that you'd like to ask? You'd like to type in the chat box? Just a second there. I'm curious, how do you think the decision is going to go in the Mississippi case based on what you've heard? Yeah, um, well, reading the Supreme Court tea leaves is a, a tricky thing to do. Uh, my sense is, my, I have two thoughts. The first is, I don't think that they're going to come out with a, you know, so to speak, middle of the road decision. I think they will either strike down Mississippi's 15 week ban as being incompatible with Roe, or they will strike down or, you know, hugely undo a lot of Roe and Casey, because I don't think you can, I don't think you can uphold the law and keep Roe and Casey at the same time. Um, that doesn't seem possible to me. So I suspect we'll either get a really great outcome or a really bad outcome. Um, and I think more often than not, I, I feel optimistic about it simply because I think we have the numbers to lose a vote um, in terms of people who you'd expect to, to vote in favor of um, striking down Roe or, or overturning a lot of it. Um, the case is just Everyone knows the history, the undergirding row is bad. Everyone knows it's bad law. Even people who support abortion rights have acknowledged this. You know, legal scholars all across the aisle um, or on both sides of the aisle have said row is just a bad legal decision. Uh, you don't have to be pro-life to know that, to think that. And so I, I, in my more optimistic moments, I hope that five justices know that and have the courage to say that. Um, Thank you. Sure. You can the just name look of in the chat box and answer whichever ones you like. So yeah, so someone asked um, about my the book that my colleague Ramesh wrote. It's called Party of Death, uh, which is kind of a bleak title, but it's a book he wrote in 2006 about um, kind of what I was talking about today, just to look at how abortion became legal, how it became such a, an important part of the Democratic Party. Um, so it's a great book to read if you want kind of the history of. Um, abortion policy up to that point, up to 2006. Um, someone asks, if SCOTUS overturns Roe, where does this issue go? It looks like Democrats will not respect principles of federalism on this issue and are attempting to send a preemptive strike with a nat national law. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, and I think, I fear that, that Republicans are not prepared for this. Uh, I fear that this is going to be an issue. It shouldn't be handled by Congress, in my opinion, um, you know, depending on the type of ruling we get. A lot will depend on if the court does strike down Roe, what does that look like? And if they say, you know, essentially abortion is nowhere in the Constitution, um, this is something that every state can decide, that, that that's the right way it should be handled, I think. Um, and then every state, all 50 states will have to make a law about it. But that certainly would not preclude uh, Joe Biden, for example, from issuing executive orders, trying to make certain types of pro-life laws impossible, would not preclude Congress from trying to pass 
uh, the Women's Health Protection Act, which I talked a little bit about in my talk. So I definitely think that's something to worry about. And I think uh, the pro-life movement has to be prepared for that and to argue against that. I think one of the best arguments would be, um, while the court has said that abortion is nowhere in the constitution, so Congress can't actually legislate on this, doesn't have the authority to, to tell states that they can't legislate on this how they see fit. Um, and so neither a, a pro-life federal law nor a pro-abortion federal law uh, would be constitutional. That might be one way, um, but I don't, I don't know what to predict really because I haven't seen pro-lifers or Republican politicians talking about this uh, very much. So I'm glad you asked about it. And um, it's something I'm hoping to write about at some point in the next couple of months. I have a question. Else, give a question. Um, do you feel like maybe the heartbeat bills are um, almost dangerous to the pro-life um, debate? Because I mean, the majority of abortions are performed, you know, prior to that 15-week mark, or even a lot of times before the um, the heartbeat can be detected. And do you think it gives like a false sense of security um, for people who support pro-life efforts? when, you know, I know when South Carolina passed the heartbeat bill and obviously was immediately, um, you know, sanctioned and, and kept from um, being enacted, all I saw was people so ecstatic that it even passed. And I, I think that they um, stopped at that point and they thought, you know, thought, and it is a win. It obviously, it is a win, the fact that it can even pass and that it has the, enough support to um, get to that point. But I think it's also giving a false sense of security that um, you know, that, okay, we're winning. We, we don't need to continue as you're talking about, you know, making these efforts and continuing to, to see this through. Um, do you have yeah. any comment on that? I know I kind of went all over the place with that. But. No problem. Yeah. I would just say, I think, um, what we've seen up to this point and the, and the heartbeat bills that I was talking about in my talk in particular, um, all of that predated this case to upset the court's going to be hearing. And I think, um, the strategy of the pro-life movement at the state level for the last maybe 30 years, I guess, since, since Planned Parenthood versus Casey has been, first of all, uh, kind of push the edges of Casey and try to pass pro-life laws that will be allowed to stand like a parental notification law or a 24 hour waiting period or, um, you know, notifying women that they can see an ultrasound before an abortion, things like that, that are kind of marginally uh, protective of the unborn. And then secondly, to pass laws that they thought would be challenged and would make their way to the Supreme Court um, and could serve as a vehicle to overturn Roe. And so I think the heartbeat bills fall into that latter camp uh, where let's say Roe somehow gets overturned, those laws are on the books, uh, but they might also serve as the case that overturns Roe. And Mississippi ended up having that case with the 15 week ban, um, which is just to say that I don't think the heartbeat bill in all places and at all times is going to be the strategy of the pro-life movement. I think it's been one provocative way of making the point that, look, there is another human being here with its own heartbeat very early in pregnancy. Uh, let's talk about that fact. And while we try to pass this law, maybe we'll end up taking a shot at Roe. I think that's been the thinking. Um, and so I don't, I wouldn't, my guess would, would be that a lot of states would not go for a, a heartbeat bill in a post-Roe. Um, legal landscape. I think they would probably try to prohibit all abortion, or many will probably stick with a 20-week ban um, or a 12-week ban, even which is much more in line with Europe. Um, so, I, yeah, I understand what you're getting at, but I think the the optics or the the kind of strategy will change. The legal strategy will change a lot if if Roe is relaxed. Alexander, we just had our president join us, Dr. Don DeCostin, uh, president of CSU. So. Uh, He's um, interested in uh, you know what you've what you shared and um, Dr. Costin, she's given her presentation and we're just asking questions now. Um, so anyone else have a question? Great, my, my uh, thanks so much for being here. Um, I uh, I really appreciate you doing this. I appreciate the work that you do. Uh, it's tough work, and I'm sure it's getting tougher by the minute um, up there where you are. But um, so are you, Are you? and you may have said this, and, and so if so, please, please repeat it on my behalf. Are you hopeful um, with the current kind of slate of cases that are making their way? You know, the one from Mississippi, Texas will be in the mix eventually. Are you, are you hopeful? You know, what's, what's the perspective of the, um, yeah. of the organization? Thanks for the question. Thanks for joining too. Um, 
I did touch on this a bit, but I'll just say um, I wouldn't take my predictions to the bank about the Supreme yeah. Court, but my yeah. sense is that uh, I'm fairly optimistic about, about Dobbs. Um, and I'll say two, the two things I mentioned about it were first, uh, I'm pretty confident that there won't be a kind of middle of the road decision. Um, I think that the decision will either strike down Mississippi's law entirely as being incompatible with Roe, or it will have to strike down Roe. I don't think there's any kind of rational decision or legally sound decision where you can uphold Mississippi's law and uphold Roe. I don't think that that's possible. Um, so I think we'll either get a bad, very bad or very good decision. Um, mm -hmm. And most of the time I feel fairly optimistic about the outcome uh, simply because I think the case against Roe is a very sound one and it doesn't require being pro-life uh, or, you know, pro-abortion restriction laws um, to think that Roe was poorly decided based on bad history, um, anything like that. And I think uh, because of the numbers we have on the court, most likely that, you know, there's at least five who are willing to acknowledge that. Um, I apologize to everyone who I had to repeat that to, but <laughs> anyway, I hope yeah, that helps a little bit. And I apologize for having her repeat it. So I'll be, I, I, I do apologize. So um, if, uh, if if Roe is struck down, then the the new status quo is what it goes back to the states. Is that what happens at that point? It'll yeah, it will depend on on the actual legal reasoning they offer in the case. There's kind of a a subset of pro life legal scholars in particular who argue that uh, the unborn child should rightly be considered a person under the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, mm -hmm. And so if the court were to, to go with that argument, then presumably that would be very complicated legally. I don't think you could legalize abortion uh, as a state if that were the decision. But my expectation is if they strike down Roe, it'll be uh, on a federalism rationale and send the, the issue back to the states. I think, you know, one of the one of the concerns would be, um, and you, you may have said this already, so, so again, I apologize, but um, concerns is, is with the chief justice is that uh, he he is uh, I guess an institutionalist, you know, out to sort of protect the institution and uh, you know the notion of what what is now nearly a you know a fifty year precedent. To what extent um, do the legal scholars that you know you're sort of reading and all what what extent do that fifty year precedent um, is that a big concern or do you think they will they will all sort of go. Um, down to the to the legal reasoning behind a, a case that for the longest time, even by, as I understand it, you know, liberal liberal scholars would have been, you know, quote, wrongly decided, unquote. So what's kind of your yeah. thought? Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, I think pro-lifers are pretty split on their predictions. I think uh, it's true that that Chief Justice Roberts is worried about the perception of the court as being overly political. And I think the, the strategy of of pro-lifers who are writing about this um, has been to make the case that overturning Roe is the best way to preserve the court as an institution. Uh, and to say Roe did perhaps the most damage to the court's public perception and, and made it a political institution more than almost anything else in our country's history. Um, mm -hmm. And so while it would uh, you know, upset the apple cart for sure to overturn it, it would be the right thing to do if you care about uh, you know, the court as an institution. And I think, um, you know, the different stare decisis uh, criteria are not there when you think about Roe and Casey, right? The idea that Roe is settled is just a fiction. This is kind of what I addressed in my, in my talk. Yeah. We've been fighting over this as intensely as ever, you know, 50 years later. Um, if Roe had settled the issue, if this were a, a settled legal decision, just to take one of the, the criteria, this would not be the situation we're in, right? Um, or the, the reliance interest is another argument they've made for abortion, that women rely on abortion, women need abortion. Um, I think a lot of feminist, uh, pro-life feminist legal scholars in particular have made a great case that, that that's not true. Um, so there are ways to take aim at, at various aspects of, um, of a way that, that Chief Justice Roberts might try to rationalize not overturning. Um, I can't tell you whether it will be successful, but I think it's a yeah. good case. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very good. Well, thanks. That's, again, that's fascinating. Um, and so day to day, what do you get to do, you know, day to day? You come into work and then you, you stay all day and you leave and you do that Monday through Friday. What are you doing like day to day? Just sheer curiosity. Yeah, I, um, I spend a lot of time 
reading pro-life writing, mm -hmm. reading pro-abortion mm -hmm. writing uh, as much time as I can, especially the history of the movement. I feel like I, I joined at the very tail end here. So I, <laughs> I kind of yeah. need to get my bearings. I've spent a lot of time doing that. Um, and then I, I write, and most of my writing is, um, you know, writing about state law, state pro-life law, state pro-abortion laws, yeah. writing about uh, or responding to oftentimes, um, you know, kind of silly pro-abortion arguments. I think it's important to push back on that. I do a lot of, mm -hmm. or I try to do a lot of coverage of um, kind of bad reporting on the abortion issue. There's a lot of media coverage that just doesn't have its facts straight, has a lot of bias. Uh, so I try to respond to that as I have time. Um, and then I prepare for talks and, and things like this that I'm going yeah. to do. What, what about, um, um, are, are there any, because you do, you read, on both sides and you know obviously you come with a with a bias which isn't a bad thing because we all have them but as you read the the, the pro-abortion arguments is there are there any pro-abortion arguments that you would say objectively you would say yeah that's pretty compelling um or, or as you read through it you go nah that's no none of this is compelling what's your yeah that's a good question um I think that and I touched on this a bit in my talk too, but something that's very disappointing about, I guess I would call it the popular case for abortion, kind of what you'd see if you looked at your average pro-choice op-ed or from a pro-choice politician um, is not compelling to me because it very rarely do they acknowledge that the unborn child is a human being. And to me, if you're making a case for abortion that doesn't acknowledge that, I, we can't really talk, right? Because that's the, my fundamental premise is that this is a human being. So the most interesting arguments that I've seen and the ones I try to engage in when they come up um, are arguments that say, yes, this is a human being, but abortion is acceptable because, and then they'll say, you know, um, you're not a person if you don't have consciousness or, and it becomes a, an ethical or um, philosophical argument at that point, which I still think are bad arguments, but they're, um, I think, intellectually honest. <laughs> and yeah. so I, I find them more interesting. Yeah, it seems to me that um, you know the ad the, the uh, advances in technology since 1973. You know, um, if if you were arguing a pro-abortion case, it seems to be harder, you know, radically harder now uh, than you know in, in 1973. If if I recall correctly, it's, you know, one of the arguments was, well, we just don't know, you know. Uh, I mean, but now clearly we know, you know. Um, yeah. And how, how do the how do the pro-abortion uh, uh, thinkers how, how do they deal with that? Um, I think a lot of them. It kind of depends on who who you're talking about. But I think the people who I typically read in kind of an op-ed capacity or um, or might do a debate with, uh, they just don't talk about it. They choose not to talk yeah. about. It. I told this little yeah. anecdote in my in my talk. I, I did a debate at Yale. A couple of years ago with a, very, a, a prominent pro-choice feminist attorney and my opening statement was all about you know this is an un, this unborn child's a human being and every human being has the intrinsic right to life and this is where all our rights come from very basic argument uh, and we yeah. we debated for maybe an hour hour and a half and she never addressed that point um because it's hard to address you become kind of a you know peter singer if you're familiar with his thought you have yeah. to argue oh yeah and justify all sorts of crazy things if that's your argument right. and people don't want to do that and so i think the kind of planned parenthoods of the world or the, the popular pro-abortion feminists of the world just hope people won't notice and just kind of keep yeah. talking about it as if they don't have to address that yeah and i, th I think you know the, the 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 fact that people have been having babies for as long as there have been people <laughs> makes this a problem you know I mean, yeah. everyone knows yeah as a baby, you know, I mean, you know, say what you want legally, but when, when you, when you uh, have a baby that I guess you could say that you wanted, because maybe you would try to, you know, rationalize away if you didn't want the baby, but right. when, when you get to the point that you want, want a baby at that point, it's baby, um, you know, exactly. uh, from the very moment. Um, and uh, I, I, I think it would be, it would be such a hard case to have to make um, knowing what you're saying is really nonsense yeah I don't envy them it's, <laughs> as I say yeah. it's, it's difficult to lie about it but it's also difficult to acknowledge and continue to defend abortion so they're in a tough position it's a lot easier to have the truth on your side as yeah. <laughs> as unpopular yeah. as it might be yeah well you know back back to back to the point about precedent you know it's um 
and stare decisis. I mean, um, that's why it's still unsettled, you right. know, after, after all these years, um, it's, it's unsettled because everyone knows in their heart of hearts that it's a baby. <laughs> right. But, right. Okay. Well, I have a yeah, sorry. No. Um, I had a question kind of a boots on the ground, you know, as a representative of students for life on campus. Um, and, you know, my per personal position is to help support these women who might be facing these unplanned pregnancies. Um, but also, you know, as we're engaging in, you know, uh, discussions with both the students and faculty, um, would you suggest that we really just try to focus on the humanity and the personhood um, and really try to, you know, I don't know, force the conversation, um, obviously with, you know, compassion and, and um, not with anger and um, vitriol. But um, would you encourage us to continue to really try and push that push and help them understand the personhood aspect of what we're talking about? You know, if they try to sidestep that, just, you know, really kind of try and bring it back. Um, or, you know, again, as my position is really to uh, find ways to on campus um, in, and in the community to really support these women, um, or should it be a, continue to be a two pronged um, yeah. effort? Yep. Thanks for asking that. I think it's really important. And um, I would definitely say both are important and equally important. And um, I'll tell you why, because the women you're helping or, or trying to help need help because the unborn human being is a, a person, right? And they deserve life. And therefore it's bad, not only for the child, but for the child's mother and father and the community they live in, if violence is enacted upon that child, right? And so um, you can't really have one, one prong without the other. Um, and I think it's, as we make the case against abortion, uh, you know, th those should never be mutually exclusive. Um, we have to help women in need because the unborn is deserving <laughs> of life and because the mother is deserving of better than abortion. And I think that's, that's the argument that really wins people over um, because of course we should never stop talking about the unborn child's humanity, personhood, um, but abortion harms everybody. And that, that's what I found in my experience is that's when you get through to people when you say, oh, actually I am pro-life, I'm against abortion because I also think it's bad for the woman, right? It's not, this is not a mother versus child thing. Um, and I think that actually makes a lot, of, a lot of headway. And that's why you see these new feminist groups kind of popping up that are often very liberal on a lot of questions, but, um, but very vociferously pro-life. I think that's kind of a winning argument for people our age at least. Yeah, it, you know, it seems to me too that um, globally, I don't know if this is the case in the U.S., but I think globally that um, most of the babies who who are aborted are female, right? I mean, is that is that true? There are certainly countries where it's very lopsided. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, because they have a preference for little boys. Yeah. Um, Alexandra, I wanted to ask a quick question. I know our time is is uh, is running out, but I know that you love history, and so I think you might appreciate this question. But there are there are people today who would say, "I'm a believer, I'm a Christian," and yet I would support someone's quote unquote right to have an abortion. Uh, could you give us a historical perspective uh, regarding how really it's just sort of just recently that anyone inside the church or claiming some kind of allegiance to the church would, would argue for abortion. I mean, it's, it's not historically a Christian position, is it? No, it's not. And I, I know this from a, a Catholic perspective, but I guess it's, it's probably very similar um, from just a, a Christian, an overall Christian church perspective too. Um, we haven't always known the science of unborn human life, but the Christian church, Christians have always been uniformly against killing any innocent human being. That's always been true. And so while St. Augustine or, you know, Thomas Aquinas might not have known when exactly there was a human being present, uh, the Catholic Church, which is what I, what I know best, has always condemned the taking of unborn human life. Um, and so the idea that these are compatible or even now set, I'll see these arguments sometimes that, uh, you know, Jesus would have been okay with abortion or a true Christian must be pro-abortion because it's good for women or women need this, or it's, you know, uncharitable not to allow people in hard circumstances to do this. Um, 
that's obviously a very backwards reading of Christianity. And that doesn't mean that women in those circumstances don't need help. Um, but it's not actually helpful to them to allow them to commit violence against their child, right? It's not actually helpful to any of us for that to be the supposed solution. Um, and so this really does frustrate me. And I'll see these articles also from time to time about you know these Christian abortionists who do this as their vocation. It just breaks my heart. It's the most ridiculous thing. Um, but I'm glad you asked that because I think it's the history of, of Christianity tells a very different story, of course. Yeah, that was one feature that made Christianity distinct from say, Greco-Roman paganism in the past and pagan, the pagan worldview, Christians valued life. They would uh, take and adopt children that were thrown on the trash heap uh, and they would right. raise them because they valued life very much. So. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, when everybody else was okay with exposing unwanted children to die, the, the Christians were the ones pushing back against that, yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we, again, we're very thankful for the time that you gave us uh, to share uh, your perspective. Very, very helpful for us. And uh, could we close in prayer? Dr. Costin, could you lead us in a time of prayer, just praying for her and for her work? I will. I will. And what, what do you like to be called? Alexandra. Alexandra. Perfect. Well, I, first of all, let, let me just say, say thank you again for the work that you're doing um, uh, in, in your generation, especially, you know, this is, this is the, the Lord's work in every, every sense of the phrase. Um, and, and thank, thanks as well for being so articulate. Uh, and so be, being uh, such a good student and for using all those gifts that God's given you for this, uh, for this great uh, purpose. And so uh, I, I look forward to watching the recording of your presentation, which I missed, but I look forward to catching up, uh, you know, once this is finished. And so let's pray. Father, we thank you for life. We thank you that the scriptures, the scriptures tell us that you knit us together in our mother's womb. You take responsibility. You take ownership. You've created every one of us uh, in your image uh, and all through scripture. Um, it's, it's the taking of the life of one who's created in the image of God, which is the ultimate uh, problem here. And so God never let, it, let us lose sight of the, of the, the fact that this, the, this battle that Alexandra is a foot soldier, uh, a, a battalion commander, and uh, is, is one that is spiritual warfare um, in, every, in every sense. And so, God, I pray that you would uh, continue to bless her intellect, continue to bless her passion, that you would use those things uh, to, to make sure that the arguments that, that she makes are put into places where, where those in authority and those with influence can not only read and digest them, but be influenced by them. And, God, we know because it's spiritual warfare, we know that the last step is something that you would do. And so I pray that you would use... Uh, Alexandra's work, her thinking, her writing um, as a precursor to set the table, to prepare the battlefield for you, the Holy Spirit coming in and doing the heart changing work that has to happen uh, for, for us to get to the place where you'd want us to get. Father, forgive all of us uh, on those occasions in our lives when we have been more about the rhetoric of being pro-life uh, and not as much about the practicality um, as was raised here just recently about how we can help those who really are in need. Uh, Father, help us to, to be those who are not just out to win an argument, but who are out to follow you, be obedient to you and save lives, uh, both of, of uh, unborn babies and their mothers um, who don't always understand everything that really is at stake uh, in both the long uh, and the short terms of their lives. And so God bless Alexandra, as you as you clearly have, continue to bless her as she does your work. And we pray that as the Supreme Court justices um, uh, consider uh, the arguments that will come before them, that you would bring them to the place where they can see that Psalm 139 is as true today as it ever has been. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank Thanks you so again. Much. Thank you, Alexandra. Good, Thanks, good to see you. Bless it's been great you. to be with you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.